Western Australia. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce this afternoon's keynote speaker, Professor Jacques Deschutour, who is currently at the Free University of Brussels in Belgium, where he is also the director of the Laboratory of Applied Biology. His research interests are centred around are centred around obtaining an understanding of the underlying mechanisms that mediate the acute adjustments and long-term adaptations of the neural control of movement. Uh, he's extremely well published. He's published over 250 peer-reviewed articles and is a recipient of a long list of awards from societies such as the French Society of Biomechanics, the Royal Academy of Sciences of Belgium and the Belgian Society of Medicine and Sports Science, amongst many others. So with that very short and brief, succinct introduction of his achievements, um, please welcome Professor Duchateau to the podium to present his lecture titled The Reorganisation of the U Neuromuscular System During Ageing, Influence of Regular Physical Activity. Well, thank you, Jacqueline, for these very kind words. First, um, good afternoon to all of you. And I would like to thank the organizer and uh, Florent Collou in particular for inviting me to give a talk and be able to speak about the topics of interest of my lab for many years now. Of course, this topic is not under the scope of this Congress, but as you will see, I will try to speak about the neuromuscular system. And I think that uh, some aspect of my talk will be of interest for some of you. Well, of course, it is a broad area, and I would like to focus on three main aspects. First, I will speak about the main change at muscle level. Then, I will discuss the reorganization of the motor system and its consequence on motor performance. And finally, I will evoke the potential benefits of physical activity to prevent or reduce the age-related change of the motor system. Well, let's start with my first part. So probably the more complete picture of the change during lifespan of the maximal force was from Van der Voort and Mick in 1986. In fact, they are subject to perform isometric plantar and dorsiflexion muscle. And as you see, you have a great variability among the individual, of course, depending on how active this person are. But you see that between 20 and 50 years old, well, the force does not decline that much. But clearly, after the age of 60 years old, there is a clear and progressive decline in this maximal force. A few la la uh, years later, while well, several studies uh, nevertheless mentioned that force is less affected for eccentric than isometric and concentric contraction. So the reduction in force is depending uh, of the modality of contraction. Of course, this loss of force is accompanied by a reduction in the muscle mass. And if we compare, for example, a scan here of a young and an older adult, uh, for the tight muscle, it is clear that the cross-sectional area is reduced with age. And you can see also that the inclusion of fat tissue uh, is much greater in the other adults. And this inclusion between the different heads of a muscle of the muscle group. Of course, as force and muscle mass are related, it is not surprising to see that the time course of change of the cross-sectional area for the vastus lateralis, for example, here, follow exactly the same, the same shape. So there is nearly no reduction up to the age of 50 year old, and then there is this progressive decline. And this decline in muscle mass is called sarcopenia. And this sarcopenia is due to two main mechanisms. The first one is an atrophy of the muscle fibers. For example, Hunter and co in 1999, well, analyzed biopsies from the vastus lateralis once again, and observed that the average decrease in fiber cross-sectional area was about one third when comparing uh, young and older subjects of 
60 to 79, 64 to 79 year old. But you may know that we have different types of muscle fiber, and usually we subdivide uh, fiber into type one, called also slow fiber, and type two, that are fast fiber. The latter group, the, the latter group can be also subdivided into type 2A and type 2B, or more exactly today we speak about type 2X. And as you see, there is a greater reduction in the cross-sectional area for type 2 fibers compared to type 2 one. So fast fiber are more prone to sarcopenia than type 1 fiber. Of course, part of the decline in the cross-sectional area of the muscle fiber are due to a reduction in physical activity, or at least in movement activity. So this part can be also observed in real sedentary people. But uh, the second mechanism uh, that we can observe in uh, old age is a reduction in the total muscle fiber. For example, in this study, Lexler in 1993 uh, count the number of muscle fibers in the vastus lateralis. It is really a tedious work because, as you see, we have about 600,000 muscle fibers. And although here also you can see some variability between subjects, but you have exactly the same time course of change. So after the age of 60 year old, there is a clear decline in the number of muscle fibers. And this uh, contrast with what we observe during immobilization, cast immobilization, for example, where we have an atrophy but without reduction in the number of muscle fibers. So the question now is why do we uh, lose a, a number of muscle fibers? So to explain this, I have to remind for those who are not familiar with the concept of motor unit that it is constituted by a motor neuron in the spinal cord is prolongation and the fiber that are innervated by this action. And it is the functional unit of the motor system. And most of you certainly know that when we produce some force and we want to increase our force, we recruited progressively motor units. But at the same time, our central nervous system also increase the discharge rate of the active motor unit. So this means that we have two mechanisms to grade the force. First, a recruitment of additional motor unit and an increase in the discharge rate in order to reach the tetanic fusion, which is the maximal force that a unit can produce. And a, an important parameter is that we recruit the motor unit up to the level of 80 to 90 percent of the maximum force in most muscle, and the last 10, 20 percent is reached by the increase in the discharge rate of the latter motor unit, the latter recruited motor unit. So it is important because if we want to reach this maximal force, we have to recruit all motor units and to drive them at maximum discharge rate. Well. I just mentioned that we lose some muscle fiber and some studies and the one of McNeil uh, and co-worker in 2005 count the number of motor unit in a human muscle. It was done in the TBIC Ontario and as you see we have about 150 motor unit when we, we are young. At the age of 61 to 69 we have only about 90 motor units and about 80 year old we have only 60 motor units. So this means that we are losing progressively motor unit and at the age of 80 we have about half and even less than half of the number of motor units we had when we were young. And how do we explain this? Well it is due to the apoptosis phenomenon and due to neurotoxic factors uh, we are the death of some motor neuron in the spinal cord, the axon degenerated, and some of the, uh, all the fiber of this motor unit become denervated. Hopefully, the surviving motor unit will produce some sporting and bicollateral 
re-innervated some of the denervated muscle fiber. The re-innervation is not complete, so this means that we are losing progressively muscle fiber, and that's why I show you this before. But this means also that each surviving motor unit contains more muscle fiber in elderly person compared to young adults. So the question we had a few years ago was if we have more muscle fiber per motor unit, but each, motor, each fiber produces less force, finally, do we have about the same force, the same relative force, or do we have more force in older adults? And so to try to understand this, we use intramuscular EMG, intramuscular electromyogram. So in fact, we insert a needle into the muscle with two wire, and this two wi very thin wire constitute a very selective electrodes. And when we ask the subject here to perform dorsiflexion contraction, uh, and we record in the tibialis anterior, here is the force produced by the subject, so the force increase progressively over time. And you can see on the electromyogram that the electro pick up two different action potential, the action potential of a small size, and then suddenly there is a recruitment of an additional motor unit. And you see clearly that this unit, when recruited, progressively display a much briefer interspikes interval, meaning that the discharge rate of this motor unit is progressively increasing. With a very complex method that we, it would be too long to explain, we can extract the force produced by these two motor units from the whole force background produced by the muscle. And here is the force produced by the first motor unit, so this one, and here is the force produced by the second unit. And as you see, well, the force produced by the second unit is greater than the first one, and also the time to peak is briefer than this first one. So this means that the second unit here is stronger and faster than the first one. If we record a great number of motor units and in the same subject, but also in different subject, we can plot, well, the force produced by each motor unit and its recruitment <coughs> threshold. So the recruitment threshold for us is the force at which this unit is recruited when uh, the subject increases progressively the force. And so if we plot this, the force of the motor unit as a function of this recruitment threshold expressed in percentage of the maximum, well, you see that we have a good linear relationship and this relationship is well known as the size principle. In fact, we recruited first the unit that developed low force and progressively we recruited motor unit that produce more force. But the main point here was the comparison with the older subject because it is for young subject and you can see that the relationship between the motor unit size and recruitment threshold shifted to the top, meaning that for each force level, you see that motor unit size, motor unit force produced in older adults is greater than young adults. So indeed, uh, older adults have what we can call a giant motor unit, so they develop more force. In terms of time to peak, well, there is also some change. Here is the distribution of the time to peak in the two groups, and you see clearly in red that the distribution is shifted to the right for older adults. And the mean value, for example, shifts from 41 milliseconds to 64 milliseconds, so more than 50% slowing in, uh, in, in the, the contractile properties of these single motor units. And again, if we plot the time to peak this time as a function of the recruitment threshold, you see clearly that there is a shift to the top meaning that all motor unit becomes slower in old age. As I mentioned before, to reach a maximal force, of course, we need to drive motor unit at very high uh, rate. And we recorded during this uh, 
while contraction, the RAM contraction, as we call it, we recorded the maximal discharge rate of a motor unit when the force reached maximal or near maximal uh, level. And here is the distribution of the discharge rate, the maximal discharge rate that we observe. And as you see in red, there is a shift to lower frequency in elderly adults, and this reduction was around 17 persons. So we have, uh, in a way, stronger, slower motor in it, which reduce discharge rate in older adults. Now, the question we had, does it change, finally, the capacity to produce maximal force and maximal speed? In addition, of course, to sarcopenia, the already change uh, the force produced by the muscle, but is voluntary activation uh, changed by this reorganization? Of course, we cannot infer from the recording of motor unit, uh, well, the maximality of the, the activation. We cannot say that all motor units are activated and they are, drive, they, they are reaching their maximal uh, discharge rate. But we have another method that combined, in fact, um, electrical and voluntary activation. And briefly, for those who are not familiar with this method, it consists to a uh, subject to produce a maximal voluntary contraction in an isometric condition, in this case, when the force reaches a plateau to stimulate the muscle with a single stimulus or a train of stimuli, as it is the case in this example. And if there is no increase in force due to the electrical stimulation, as indicated by the interpreted line here, this means that the subject is fully able to activate all the motor unit at their maximal uh, capacity. But if there is some extra force due to the electrical stimulation, as it is the case here for this subject, this means that, in fact, the full capacity of the subject should be here and not there. So this means that this subject presents a deficit in voluntary contraction. So it cannot, in voluntary activation, sorry. So it cannot recruit either all motor unit or drive them to their maximal potential. So there are a few uh, studies in the literature that have compared this activation level in young and older adults. And well, the conclusion of all these uh, studies is that there is, on average, no real difference, at least no big difference. For example, here, young adults are able to fully activate the their muscle on average at 97 person, and the older adult at 94, something like this. So the difference is not that big. But if we look at individual value, you see that all the young subject, uh, at least half of the young subject, were able to activate their muscle with full capacity. The other subject, well, have a small deficit. But for the older adult, you see that only one was able to fully activate his muscle, and the other have a good uh, activation, nevertheless, as many young subjects. But they are two outliers, as you see, and well, with nearly 15 and even more percent of uh, deficit in activation. And of course, in this case, well, this deficit can conduct to a submaximal voluntary activation. So there could be a deficit in activation in some subject, but not in all this subject. Well, no, does it affect, does this reorganization of the neuromuscular system affect the speed of contraction? And one way to check it in laboratory setting is to ask subject to perform very quick contraction like this. We call it ballistic contraction. In fact, the subject in isometric condition try to reach a certain level of force as fast as possible and then relax immediately. And we compute the first derivative of this force signal. And so we can get with this first uh, peak the rate of force development and more exactly, but I wanted to simplify things, uh, rate of torque development 
in this case. So we did it in the, with, in the dorsiflexion muscle once again, and here is the surface EMG uh, of one of the agonist muscle, the tibialis anterior, and here is the EMG activity of the antagonist, one of the antagonists, the soleus muscle. But if we compare now the performance of an older subject, you see clearly that the slope is reduced and also that the peak rate of force development is drastically reduced. And if we compute an average value, we observe that a reduction of about 50% in the rate of force development, but only a reduction of about 30% in the maximal force. So this means that speed is more affected than force by uh, aging. But of course, our interest was mainly to look at the discharge rate of motorinate during this fast contraction. So here is an example when we recorded intramuscular EMG, and you can see here a big action potential that fire four times during the ba this ballistic contraction. On the expanded stem scale, you, s you can see here the interspikes interval between uh, this firing. And you can see that the interspikes interval progressively increase during the successive firing, meaning that the, the instantaneous discharge rate is slightly decli declining in the young subject. But when you compare well, a similar contraction in an older subject, you see that, in fact, the discharge rate is low because the, the interspikes interval is uh, longer, and you can also see that this interspikes interval uh, is increased progressively over time, so meaning that this uh, discharge rate is progressively declining. So what we did was to uh, measure a great number of motor unit. It is also a tedious work. Uh, I must say, hopefully, I have good students that spend their time to measure this. So what we did is to measure, in fact, the, fir the first three interspikes interval for each unit. Uh, we didn't go further because, well, in fact, many units didn't fire more than four times in such very quick contractions. And if you look at, well, the fourth time curve, you see that, in fact, uh, this uh, discharge rate occur, of course, at the time uh, the force is bu building up. So it is a very important um, time point uh, during the force development. So here is the distribution uh, for uh, the first interspikes interval for the, for the young and elderly subject. And I must say that uh, the mean value is about 72 Hertz in the young and 58 Hertz for the elderly. This means a reduction of nearly 20% in the maximal discharge rate because the, the maximal capacity of discharge for a motor unit is observed during this first uh, interspikes interval. And after that, you can see that, well, there is a progressively greater difference between the two groups of subject, the difference being 28 and 34 person for the second and third interspikes uh, respectively. So this means that the dis maximal discharge rate is less and also the decline uh, over the different successive discharge is progressively uh, greater for elderly compared to young subjects. Of course, the does not tell us whether this contributed to reduce the rate of force development that we observe. And so what we did was to compare the performance during voluntary contraction, the, the data that I just mentioned, and we also stimulate in some subject electrically the muscle with uh, three pulses at high frequency, uh, 10 millisecond interval, so in this case, we record mainly the rate of the intrinsic rate of force development of the muscle without taking into account voluntary activation. And if we do the difference between young and older adults, you can see that the reduction is about 40% uh, 
when the contraction is electrically induced and the difference was 50% when it was induced by voluntary activation. So this means that the difference between the two should be due to the reduced muscle activation and we think that the decline in maximum discharge rate likely contributed to, the reduce, to reduce the rate of force development of fast contraction. So about one-fifth should be due, one-fifth of the reduction should be due to voluntary activation. Of course, uh, well, our capacity is not limited to maximal force and uh, maximal speed, but also uh, during fine motor skill, it is important to be very precise in what we are doing. So a way to uh, measure this in laboratory setting is in fact to ask subject to sustain different level of force and to, to keep the force as stable as possible at different force level. And this was done for, uh, with the first dorsal interstices and, and muscle. And as you see, there is some fluctuation around the mean. And it is not surprising that when we compare the performance of an older subject, there is uh, even greater force fluctuation at the force plateau. So one way to quantify this fluctuation is to measure the coefficient of variation uh, of force during the force plateau, which means the ratio between the standard deviation and the mean force value expressed in percentage. And if we do that, you see that while well, the coefficient of variation is much more greater for very low load, so very small load. Of course, it is expressed in relative value here. That's why we have a greater coefficient of variation. But you see that for load comprising between 20 to 50 percent of the maximal voluntary contraction, there is nearly no difference. But the main point here is that the difference between young and elderly subject is much greater for a very low level of force compared to higher force level. So there is more fluctuation um, during uh, contraction in elderly subject, and most probably because, well, each motor unit develops more force. So when you are far to the tetanic fusion, every time the unit is discharging, it contributes to a greater force level relative uh, to the maximal force in elderly compared to a young subject. So you have more fluctuation in the force signal. This was also done during, uh, well, rising and lowering a load. So here is the setup. This experiment was done, in fact, in Roger Inoka's lab. And the subject is uh, moving, is uh, doing um, abduction of the, of the index. And low, uh, rising a load, you don't see it. But uh, the, the subject had to follow a target on the screen of the oscilloscope. And you see that it performed quite well. But for example, the performance of this subject, all the subject, is much worse. And in fact, there is a greater, uh, well, a worse performance during the lowering phase of the, the movement. So this means during the eccentric contraction here compared to the concentric contraction. So eccentric contraction is more difficult to control than uh, shortening contraction. So that's what we observe um, on the neuromuscular system and on the performance of this system uh, with age. And now the last question uh, I want to ask is, can we benefit of physical activity on the age neuromuscular system? And in fact, uh, a few years ago, while well, there was a study published by Charles Rice Group in Canada, they compared the number of motor units in young and elderly subjects, once again in the tibialis anterior, because it is a good muscle to do such recording. But they compare also this number of motor units in master runner. And so, in fact, this uh, person trained nearly every day and run about 60 kilometers per week. This is quite big. And in that case, 
they observed that there was no reduction in the number of motor units. So it seems that exercise can, be, can have a neuroprotective effect on the loss of motor neurons. However, two years later, in a successive publication, they also showed the data for the same subject, but on the biceps brachii that was not used during running, of course, at, at least not same point, uh, this at the same point as uh, the tibialis anterior, for, of course. And you see that in that case, there is a reduction in the number of motor units. So this means that this neuroprotective effect um, of exercise on motor neuron, well, is effective uh, if you train these different muscles. If you, you train only a few group of muscles, of course, this uh, effect will not be present. But part of that title was use it or lose it. So this, this is exactly what uh, it is important. We have to use our muscle uh, to, be, to stay active and we can at least avoid or at least delay this effect of um, apoptosis. And this is in line with animal studies that al also show that we can preserve our number of motor units well, if we continue to be active. Of course, well, Many people cannot be active during their professional life and wait uh, their retirement, that will, it will be the case for me, to be more active and, and try to regain, to recover part of their physical capacity. And so this means that, can, uh, and this the question is, can we, well, recover part of this uh, reduction in physical capacity? I present here the probably one of the first uh, studies on strength training um, in elderly subject. In fact, they train subject, as you see, from 60 to 70 year old, three days per week, uh, with, well, heavy load, 80% of one RM. And we have here, well, the maximal load that can be lifted with the knee extensor and the knee flexor during the 12 weeks of training. And you see that at the end of the training program, well, the load was about twice the one at the beginning of the training program. And this study also showed for the first time that some hypertrophy is still possible at old age. For example, they analyzed the cross-sectional area of the vastus lateralis, and you see that after six months, there was already some increase. And after 12 weeks, the increase is even greater. And uh, furthermore, take some biopsies and analyze the cross-sectional area of type 1 and type 2 fibers. And same conclusion, both uh, types of fiber show an increase in the cross-sectional area, which may be a less a lower effect for type 2 than type 1, and a less general effect than in young subjects. Of course, we cannot have at all age the same capacity for hypertrophy, but anyway, we can regain some muscle mass. More recently, we were interested to look at the capacity to increase voluntary activation with strength training and balance training. So we combined these two uh, training program and subject uh, train two days per week for six weeks. And here we tested voluntary activation with the method I described previously. And as you see, there is an increase in the average voluntary activation after the six week of training. Of course, we know well that after such brief training program, it is mainly neural adaptation that explain the increase in maximal force. And so it is not surprising that we have also an increase in uh, the maximal voluntary torque produced by the plantar flexion muscle after only six weeks. And if we plot the increase in maximal force as a function of the gain in voluntary activation, as you see, we have a very good association, meaning that uh, those who increase voluntary activation to a great extent have also a greater increase in force. And I would like simply to mention 
that if you increase your voluntary activation by 5%, you have about more than 20% of increase in DMVC talk. So for those who present uh, a deficit in voluntary activation, simply doing quite a, a few number of maximal voluntary contraction allow you to, uh, to, to increase very quickly this voluntary activation level and thus the maximal force. Can we increase uh, the speed of contraction? Well, this uh, study was done by Ben Barry in Australia in 2005, and he trained a subject between 60 to 79 year old. He trained the elbow three days per week for four weeks with a load that was progressively increased from 50 to 95% of the maximal force, and you have a representative curve, a force time curve, before and in interrupted line after the training program, showing that uh, for all time point, there is an increase in torque produced by the muscle. So the rate of force development uh, was increased, as shown here, the peak rate of force development, but also at different time point, you can see that the rate of force development was increased. So we can indeed increase the rate of force development even at an advanced, advanced age. And to understand where these adaptations occur, in fact, they measure the EMG activity in uh, four of the involved muscle in elbow flexion. And well, for three different time points, you can see that after training, there is a general tendency to an increase in the EMG activity, meaning that voluntary activation should be increased. And we have no data today, but probably due to this increase in the discharge rate that I mentioned before in my talk. Now, can we improve the steadiness of force when we maintain some uh, level from different level? It was the performance before and after a training program in the first dorsal interstice that consisted of three days per week uh, during 12 weeks of movement of different types uh, with load of 10 and 70 person of one RM. And it is clear that is this in this uh, older adult you see that it is more stable. So steadiness is improved after this program. And if we compare the coefficient of variation for force, you see that, well, the performance here, the coefficient decreased very quickly within four weeks and then stay at the same level compared to the young adults. So we can uh, improve the steadiness of the contraction uh, very quickly, within weeks, but of course we cannot uh, reach the same level as the young subject simply because of, uh, of the increase in the size of uh, the motor unit at all age. So if we pass the, the, the stage of uh, this uh, re-innervation, this means that we will lose uh, our capacity to keep the force very steady during uh, contraction. Same uh, observation for movement. You see here the performance after uh, a training program similar to the one that I described for the previous slide. And it also, even within two weeks, there is an improvement, uh, not only during shortening, but also during the lengthening contraction. So such training program can improve the steadiness and the precision of our movement. So, and then, I reached the conclusion of my talk, so I can say in summary, summary that aging is characterized by a profound reorganization of the motor system, at least if we don't uh, stay active during uh, our life. This change contributes to affect the voluntary activation capacity to produce maximal force, but also the rate of force development and the loss of performance during fine motor task. This alteration can be prevented or reduced to some extent with practice and training. At least I hope I convince you. And 
the final conclusion is in addition to nutrition. I didn't spoke about that, but nutrition is also an important aspect to uh, keep person earthy. Exercise appears to have a neuroprotective effect on the neuromuscular system. And before the finishing my talk, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of uh, two of my co-workers that collect many of the data I present you today, Dr. Malgorzata Klaas and Stefan Baudry, and also the financial support of some uh, institution. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor, for an interesting talk. Uh, a seasoned professional as he is, we've got a few minutes for, for questions. And can I just uh, remind you to state your name and your affiliation? Yes, uh, Mark Ross, Sanford, University of Reading. Um, I was pleased as to how much the contribution uh, of technical Yes, OK. Well, I, I did not uh, show you data uh, on this. But uh, because of a time constraint, but uh, while there are some studies showing that there is a reduction in stiffness of the, of the tendon uh, with aging, and probably this contributed to reduce the rate of torque development also. But uh, today it is difficult to say what percentage tendon uh, stiffness change contribute to the reduction in the rate of force development. But of course, this should contribute, at least I, I, I think. Roland van der Tillen from uh, Norway. Um, you said the, the, the older people are slower, larger motor units with lower uh, discharge range. And then afterwards you show, okay, exercise will help them to get better in the steadiness and so on. But what changes then? Because that you didn't show now. What changes? You said it, perhaps the, the discharge rates go up again, but do the motor units change something? Or Well, we don't have that much uh, data on this. Uh, I can simply say that uh, there was only one study uh, analyzing uh, motor unit discharge rate after strength training in uh, older adults. And they show an increase, at least at the beginning, of the strength training program. But it was not uh, recorded during fast contraction. It was during uh, slow contraction. So we don't have any data during uh, really fast contraction. So, so can you spe speculate? What, what of those changes? Because you see there are changes after exercise. Yes. So something has to be changed. But what? Yes, but probably there, there is some uh, increase in the discharge rate, at, at least I presume. Uh, as we, I show you that there is a reduction in, in this discharge rate, rate, but perhaps there is also some intrinsic change uh, in the muscle also, and the beam can change tendon stiffness too. So, uh, well, we need more, more data. I'm sorry, <laughs> cannot go further. Um, on behalf of the society, uh